This is Game Night with Josh Hennig on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. Now, live from the Matt Black Kia Studios. Oh, what a oh, oh, what a move. Here's Josh Hennig. Thursday edition of Game Night on 97.3 ESPN. And as usual, nothing is boring on the Philadelphia sports front. Flyers, big 6-3 win over the Pens yesterday. You heard all the action right here on 97.3 ESPN. Also, we have Sixers versus Heat tonight. It looks like the whole band is getting back together. Aside from Seth Curry, looks like we're going to have guys back in action tonight. We got Kevin McCormick joining us coming up at 620 to get more into the Sixers game tonight and also the aftermath of the James Harden fiasco where we all were just totally borderline overwhelmed, shall we say, yesterday when it came to all that news. Then when it, the trade didn't actually happen, it was just like, and we all breathed a sigh of relief. Not because we were so against having him here, but at some point we were just like, all right, at least the trade was made for goodness sake. It felt like every five minutes there was a new version of the story going on. Also this hour, I got some betting odds for you. My friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook have some odds on who's going to be the next Eagles head coach. I think some of them are pretty ridiculous. You can figure out which ones when I get to them in a little bit as well. 609-403-0973 is the text board to get in on the conversation. 609-403-0973. But I got to start with the aftermath of this James Harden stuff. Listen. Whether you are a Woj guy, whether you're a Shams guy, whether you're whoever your number one NBA guy is, you knew that yesterday the news was popping like crazy. And as the dust has settled in the last 24 hours, one thing has become very clear. It seems like Harden was all along going to go to the Nets. It seems like this was all a bunch of sleight of hand when it came to the Rockets. And according to Adrian Wojnarowski of ESPN and Chris Haynes of Yahoo Sports, it seems like the Rockets were really never going to trade him to the Sixers. And that apparently Tillman Fertitta did not want to make a deal with Daryl Morey, according to Chris Haynes. And that Adrian Wojnarowski was saying that, listen, you know, the, the Nets were the preferred trade partner for the Rockets all along. And it does make you feel like basically the Rockets used the Sixers to maximize what they could get out of this trade from the Nets and the Cavs and the Pacers. Because under normal circumstances, I don't know if this trade gets done. If this was January 14th in a regular NBA season, in a non-pandemic COVID protocol environment, if this was a world where things were not as they are right now, I'm not fully sure this trade gets done the way it did. Because number one, let's not forget, that's a lot of trade assets to move for a guy who's already in his 30s. Harden is not 28. He's not 26. He's not, he's on the other side of 31. All right. And he's got two more years left on his contract and then he can bounce. He can go away. He can disappear. And I'm not calling him old, but to give up that many first round picks and a pick swap tells me that the Rockets are trying to milk the situation for every little thing they could. I've heard multiple people say on ESPN now, NBA reporter Malika Andrews, as well as Ramona Shelburne, that Harden knew that he was going to be traded soon when he made the statements he did on Tuesday night. So if that's the case, that Harden knew he was already out the door, and if Tillman Fertitta, the owner of the Rockets, didn't want to trade with the Sixers, then the only reason why the Sixers' name was there was because they were being used to amplify the trade. And let's be realistic. The team that won that deal are the Rockets. They got so many picks coming their way, and they got Victor Oladipo out of it. And 
They got some other nice players as well. Oh, by the way, the Cavs made out great. I mean, they got Jared Allen. Karis LeVert's going to the Pacers. You could argue that the team three years from now that is going to be the worst off is the Nets because they're going to have no draft pick assets at all. And we've been through this before. The, the Nets have been in a situation where they've sold their future for the present and it didn't work out in those instances. So at some point, I'm looking at this team and I'm saying you might be better off with not making this trade because the amount that the Nets had to give up to get James Harden, they sacrificed so much to get that guy. And there's still no guarantee that Kyrie Irving is ever going to come back and play for this team. Or even if he does come back, how many days is he going to stay back? Because the Nets right now, to me, feels like James Harden is here as much to fill the void of Kyrie because they know that Harden will actually be on the floor compared to Kyrie. Kyrie Irving, and Mike Gale brought this up earlier on the Sports Bash, has missed a ton of games over the last several years. During the same stretch of years, Harden is averaging over 70 games a year, and Kyrie is barely averaging around 60. So to me, for the Nets, this game was as much about getting somebody you know is going to be on the floor than it was about anything else. And if that's the Nets' plan, good for you, man. I mean, you got James Harden, you got Kevin Durant, but there's no guarantee you're going to win a championship. What if one of those guys gets injured? What if Kyrie decides when he comes back if he comes back next week, that, oh, I, I have another reason I'm not going to play and do my job again. You know, I'm making millions of dollars to play basketball, but I don't actually feel like playing basketball. I mean, I mean, what a petulant little child living in his own reality. Apparently, Kyrie lives in a world where you can get paid and not to work, and he's the only person I know who can do that. At least coaches get paid to go away. Kyrie gets paid to not do anything. So for the Sixers, where do they go from here? Well, where they go from here is, number one, you haven't even played 20 games yet this year. It's hard to come to any massive conclusions about this basketball team when you haven't even gotten the 20 games. Now, I've personally been frustrated with Ben Simmons. And I hear everybody who sits there and says, you got to move him, you got to trade him. I'm frustrated too. But I am not going to sacrifice the future of this team all together for a small window. And I was saying this yesterday on Twitter, at Josh Hennig on Twitter. You cannot put Tyrese Maxey in a deal like that. Tyrese Maxey, yeah, he's a rookie. But he has played at a level that, frankly, is incredible. Think about this. Tyrese Maxey, has scored more points in fewer games, fewer minutes this year than Ben Simmons. That's right. Ben Simmons has 70 more minutes this season. And Tyrese Maxey has scored six more points than him. Tyrese Maxey is averaging less than a turnover per game. Ben Simmons is averaging 3.8 turnovers per game. Tyrese Maxey has shown you something In these first 10 games. And you know what he's shown you? He has shown you. That he is a bonafide NBA guard. I don't know if he's going to the Hall of Fame. I don't know if he's going to be a superstar. But man it just looks like the Sixers. Have hit a home run out of the park with this pick. And to trade Tyrese Maxey potentially. For any player like James Harden. Just would have felt like a real letdown. Because right now, the Nets are going to have to figure out how do they fill out the rest of their roster. You have more money committed to Kyrie Irving, James Harden, and Kevin Durant than some teams have payrolls in total in the NBA right now. They're going to have to get really creative and struggle to fill up that roster while the Sixers have some of the most depth in the entire league. The Sixers were competitive with a Nuggets team with basically nobody on the court, aside from Maxie and Dwight Howard. 
That's depth. That's something that teams like Boston and the Nets don't have now. That's something that the Miami Heat, they thought they had until they had some of these contact tracing and other injuries that have hit them. The Sixers have depth, and to me, that's very, very valuable. And I think that cannot be undersold at all moving forward. Again, Sixers versus the Heat. They have almost everyone back tonight except for Seth Curry. You can hear the, all the action coming up here on 97.3 ESPN. Coverage begins at 7 o'clock. Kevin McCormick live at the center will join us in about 10 minutes from now. 609-403-0973 is the text board to get on the conversation. 609-403-0973. Now, I didn't get a chance to talk much about the Eagles yesterday because I wasn't on with game night. But, man. All this news coming out of Robert Sala interviewing and Joe Brady potentially interviewing and all that stuff. Well, my friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook, you can use promo code Hennig when you sign up. They get all kinds of opportunities. For example, 25 to 1 odds boost when you bet on any team to win this weekend in the NFL playoffs on FanDuel Sportsbook. Use the promo code Hennig when you sign up. Well, FanDuel Sportsbook set the odds. For the Eagles, who's going to be their next head coach this afternoon? The betting favorite is Robert Sala at plus 200. Mike Kafka is number two at plus 450. Number three is Kellen Moore at plus 500. He's interviewing for the job as well. The Eagles want to talk to Brian Dable. He's high on the list as well. He's tied with Eric Bieniemy. After that is Deuce Daly, Lincoln Riley, Jared Mayo, Todd Bowles. Those are your prohibitive favorites, quote-unquote, in terms of, you know, closest odds. Uh, further down the list is Joe Brady at plus 1,100. To me, that tells me that even though the, they want to interview him, that sounds like the expectation that Brady is going to stay potentially with the Panthers or he would take another job. Although, here's the thing with Joe Brady. Joe Brady right now is the same age as when the Rams hired Sean McVay, so... Hiring a guy that young with that small of a coaching resume might not be the craziest thing in the world. But I find the list of Eagles coaching candidates interesting because you're covering a lot of different bases with these guys. Robert Salat, the passionate leader of men, defensive coordinator. Mike Kafka, the not-as-well-known quarterback coach. We've heard that story before, have we not? You know, Andy Reid. Not very well-known quarterback coach. Became the Eagles head coach. Not saying Mike Kafka is the same thing, but can't ignore the similarity. Kellen Moore, the overlooked offensive coordinator down in Dallas, a guy who Jerry Jones told Mike McCarthy, you have to keep this guy in your staff. He knows the offense. The offense knows him. Kellen Moore turned down the Boise State head coaching job to stay with the Dallas Cowboys. That tells you what he thinks about his job down in Dallas. Brian Dable, that guy's going to get a head coaching job. I think we all agree with that. I'm not 100% sure it's going to be this offseason, but I know it's going to be either this offseason or next offseason. That guy's done an incredible job with Josh Allen. That guy has shown you that he can coach at multiple, multiple levels. Eric B. Enemy, another guy that I'm going to assume will get a coaching job this offseason. But the Eagles haven't sent in a request to interview him yet, even though he's on the list. Now, Deuce Daly is interesting. Deuce Daly is your leader of men, doesn't have the coordinator background, it's not a play caller. He's probably a guy who would hire some really strong offensive and defensive coordinators to coach those sides of the ball. There's one thing that all these guys have in common, though, that I just mentioned. Sala, Kafka, Moore, Dable, Biennemi, and Staley. They're all hot names. But with Urban Meyer closing in on the Jaguars job down in Jacksonville, there's no guarantee that all of those guys are going to get head coaching jobs this offseason. Like I said, the Eagles haven't even requested to interview the enemy yet. They requested to interview Jared Mayo. Jeff Mosher was reporting there were conversations with Lincoln Riley. There's a possibility that one of those names I just gave you is not going to be a head coach. Not just because of the Eagles. 
But sometimes the hot name isn't the guy who always gets hired. There's other variables that go into this. Fit. Personalities. Relationships. Things that get overlooked at times when it comes to who gets hired and who doesn't. Do you really think Adam Gaze got hired in New York because he was the best coaching candidate? I don't think so. By the way, that GM that hired him got fired, and now Joe Douglas fired him. Guys don't always get the job because they're the best candidate. Ben McAdoo, when he didn't take the Eagles job, he went back to the Giants and became their head coach. That didn't turn out too great for the Giants. Two head coaches later, they finally got a legitimate head coach. Sometimes the best guy doesn't get the job, and that's the thing you got to be careful about. These are some great candidates, but there's no guarantee who's actually going to walk away with a job this offseason. 609-403-0973 is the text board. 609-403-0973 with your text a little bit later in the hour, but coming up next, Kevin McCormick live from the center Sixers versus Heat. You hear all the action at the top of the hour right here on 97.3 ESPN. And, of course, don't forget Kev McCormick, Jason Blevins, and Paul Hudricks, all their Sixers coverage at 97.3 ESPN.com and the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Seattle City. You're listening to Game Night with Josh Hennig on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. Game Night on 97.3 ESPN being brought to you by WeightliftingHQ.com. Use my code RADIO10 at checkout for 10% off your entire order. Squat and bench press, kettlebells, dumbbells, cardio and fitness machines, resistance bands, and more. Whatever you need to meet your health and fitness goals in 2021, you can do it. With my friends over at weightliftinghq.com, you cannot beat their incredibly competitive prices as well as their customer service. They deliver the equipment right to your home and set it up for you so you can get started as soon as possible working out from home with weightliftinghq.com. Code Radio 10 at checkout for 10% off your entire order is Radio 10 at checkout, weightliftinghq.com. Joining us right now on the Boardwalk kind of Hotline, Kevin McCormick. He covers the 76ers for us over at 97.3 ESPN.com. He is live at the center tonight. Of course, you can follow him on Twitter at KevinMCC973 all night long for all your Sixers coverage and updates on the game. Kevin, how are you doing up there? Josh, I'm doing good, man. I just kind of settled in now. I've got to see a little bit of warm-ups going, and I'm, I'm ready for tonight's matchup. So before we get to the actual game tonight, I got to get your thoughts on the aftermath of the James Harden stuff from the last 24 hours. And you and I kind of had to start having this conversation uh, before we got on the air tonight, listen, the more we get further along, the more I feel like that the, the Sixers were basically used by the Rockets to escalate this trade, to get the maximum deal. And if I'm the Sixers, I feel okay today because of the fact that I didn't mortgage my entire future and sacrifice all of my bench depth to get one guy. Exactly. Like everything what you just said Brooklyn completely mortgaged their future for pretty much, you know, one to two swings at the plate to try and win a title. And then after that, it is a huge question mark. So it was great to see Daryl Morey kind of just stand pat and kind of draw that line in the sand of where he wasn't going to cross to make the Sixers better, but also not open your window so big in the short term just to pretty much close it shut in the long term. And like you said, in terms of which teams were being used, it's actually kind of funny how that's how it played out just because through this whole process, it felt like Brooklyn was the team that was kind of being strung along and, you know, used as the leverage to kind of force the Sixers to throw Ben Simmons into the mix. When in reality, looking at it now, it seems like the, you know, Tilma Fertitta and the Rockets strung the Sixers and Ben Simmons along to try and up the package that they got from Brooklyn. And in reality, it worked. When you look at the Nets now, my biggest thing with the Nets is, okay, so what if Durant, and Kyrie and Harden are all playing. Well, in the playoffs, depth is an important thing. Who comes in when those guys come out? I'm sorry, but I'm not really depending on Joe Harris, whereas I saw a Sixers team that had Tyrese Maxey, Dakota Mathis, and Dwight Howard keep up with the Denver Nuggets over the weekend. So I'm feeling way better about the Sixers roster right now than I am about the Nets' top-heavy roster. Absolutely. I mean, depth is a key thing. Even if you look back to the Warriors dynasty, as great as their starting lineups were at times, they also still had great bench depth. 
if you look at, you know, most teams that have won an NBA title, it doesn't take, you know, top, you know, top two or three guys. You need a solid eight to nine guys that can go out there and produce for you. And in reality, Brooklyn gave up all of that to acquire Harden. It's like you just said, they're a very top heavy team now. And, it, you know, it brings a lot of questions because if you look at the beginning of the year, they're arguably more of a threat because you're looking at a starting lineup headlined by Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving. And then you go to their bench unit and you're looking at guys like Jared Allen, who's a stud at the center position, Karis LeVert, who in my eyes was a front runner early on for six man of the year. And now you lose all that and you pretty much have to go back to square one and kind of create a new system with these three stars of Harden, Irving, and Durant. Now, I'm not going to sit here and act like, you know, I'm in love with Ben Simmons or that was the reason why I didn't make a deal because I'm not that guy. But what I will say is that I'm open to the idea of moving on from Simmons. I'm just not willing to do it at the at the sacrificing of everything and anything to get a player. So is there a player out there in the league that's been rumored or talked about that you would say if that guy's name came up, yes, I would make a Ben Simmons trade? There are very few guys in the league right now that I think I would toss Ben Simmons in a deal for, but one of the names is a guy that we just saw last week in Bradley Beal. I mean, he's a phenomenal guard. With the way that Washington's going, who knows, he could potentially be the next star that's you know on the trade block and teams are looking to move in for. So if he becomes available, I for sure could see the Sixers being in contention for that and Ben Simmons potentially being a piece in that kind of deal. Kevin McCormick joining us here on the boardwalk kind of hotline on 97.3 ESP. You got all the Sixers coverage over at Kevin MCC 973 on Twitter, as well at 97.3 ESPN.com and the 97.3 ESPN mobile app. Kevin, let's get to the game tonight because the big news that popped off was when Doc Rivers basically said near the beginning of his presser, oh, by the way, almost everyone is back. That's a huge deal for this team that – has really been struggling to have bodies on the floor, and now they're getting Tobias back and Shake Milton. So what is your perspective on the band getting back together tonight? Hopefully it starts this trend of the Sixers starting to look like how they looked in the beginning of the season and just being phenomenal on both ends of the floor. If you look at these past couple of games, I mean, there's been a lack of ball handling and, you know, the rough shooting at times. We've seen some very clunky lineups. So hopefully we get back to seeing that fluid six or scene that we saw on both ends of the floor, which we should most likely see now with guys like Tobias Harris, Shake Milton, and Matisse Seibel being able to come back tonight. What is Tyrese, Tyrese Maxey's role moving forward? Because he's been the, the light in the darkness. He's been a star, basically, ever since everything happened with every, all the time and minutes he's had to play. I mean, he's hitting a three the other night. He's dominating the Nuggets game. So what is his role now that all these guys are back? I think you go back to what you were, you know, going with in the beginning of the season. And we saw Tyrese Maxey and Shake Milton being that backcourt of the second unit and kind of leading that unit. And I think there's a very good role for Tyrese Maxey right now, although you potentially could make a case that he could be inserted to the starting lineup. Keeping him in that second unit is better for his growth because if when sharing the floor with Ben Simmons, it'll take the time that he can be on the ball away from him. Well, with that second unit, he could be kind of that guy that, that's running the second unit in the offense, and him and Shake Milton can come on and off the ball at times, and we can see Tyrese Maxey play more free and be, you know, the you know, offensive spark plug that he's been for this team while they've been depleted. I know that Doc Rivers was very happy with the play of Isaiah Joe. Touch on your thoughts on what he had to say about Isaiah Joe pregame, and what have you seen from Joe yourself? I've actually been a very big fan of how Isaiah Joe's played so far. Even through this draft process, he was a guy that I had circled as a sleeper. There is a lot of potential there, and he showed it in these couple of games. He's showed some really nice flashes that down the road that he really could become a nice rotation piece. I think he needs to put on a little bit more muscle to, you know, kind of go at NBA defenders and things and such. But in terms of shooting the ball, he showed that he could be lights out when he gets hot. Doc Rivers said before the game today that, when looking back at film, he was a guy that stood out for him on Tuesday night. Not only did he stand out offensively, but he stood out defensively as well. So, you know, when your second round pick is in the graces of the coach like that and stepping up and, you know, really making the most of the opportunity that was put in front of him, I think it's a great time for his development and his confidence on the floor going forward. You mentioned what Doc said about his defense. I feel like one thing that's just overlooked through all this is the fact that when we started the year, when Doc Rivers was sitting down with the media before the year even began, he said he went to have the number one defense in the league. And statistically, for the most part, they've been pretty much in that territory. 
what does getting all these guys back mean for the Sixers' defense moving forward? We get to see the defensive powerhouse that we saw in the beginning of the season. You know, Tobias Harris, although he's not looked at as more of a defensive star, has really blossomed into kind of a two-way player since coming here to Philadelphia. So having guys like him and Shakeback, who's another guy who's improved on the defensive end, we get, I think we'll see more of that just suffocating and, you know, just kind of smash mouth defense that we've seen from the Sixers early on in this season. Sixers versus Heat tonight. You hear all the action at 7 o'clock. Tom McGinnis in the call right here on 97.3 ESPN. Kevin McCormick, our Sixers beat writer up at the center tonight covering the game. He is in the house, and you can see all of his videos of the pregame warm-ups over at Kevin MCC 973. Kevin, one of the things you've put on your videos very often when you're at these games, and Paul Hudrick has done the same thing, you guys always like to point out, Hey, look, there's Sam Cassell with Ben Simmons working out for the game. Oh, there's Sam Cassell with Tobias Harris or Shake Milton. What do you believe has been the huge difference about Sam Cassell being brought to this coaching staff compared to coaches who have been here before? I think he's just a phenomenal hire just in the sense of being, you know, being a former player is always a nice boost. And he's just always been a strong development guy. And I think we've seen it at times now. I mean, look at the jump that Tobias Harris has taken this year. Obviously, part of that goes to being under Doc Rivers and Doc Rivers understanding a system that works for him. But also, you know, having guys like Sam Cassell back there who are out on the floor with them every night, you know, helping them perfect their mechanics at times. And for a guy like Ben Simmons, hopefully grow his confidence. When Sam Cassell was in Washington with John Wall, John Wall credited Sam Cassell a lot for helping him blossom as a jump shooter. So although we've seen a little bit of jump shooting for Ben Simmons this season. Hopefully having a guy like Sam Cassell around will help him become more comfortable as a jump shooter, and you know, hopefully we see more in-game. Now, you mentioned Simmons and his confidence. Is that what you believe? Do you believe that the problem with Simmons and his lack of offensive assertiveness throughout this has been – Is it, do you really feel it's confidence? Do you think it's a psychological block? Because I know a lot of fans, that's the reason why they don't want him anymore. A lot of fans are like – get rid of this guy, you know, he doesn't score, he doesn't try to score. They don't value what he does as a, as a uh, you know, floor guy, a floor general. They don't value what he does on defensive end. All they want to see is Ben scoring. I think it really just comes down to when he's out there, he's looking to be a pass-first guy. He wants to facilitate. He wants to make the players around him better and was thriving at it this season. I mean, like I've harped on a lot tonight. Tobias Harris has taken a nice step this year. Seth Curry's been shooting the ball phenomenally. You know, stuff like that doesn't happen just because of a new coach, new system. You know, it's also the guy facilitating and running the offense as well. So I think it's more just than his game being more of a facilitator. He He's not always looking to score, which can be an Achilles heel at times because sometimes you need him to be more assertive. But reality, with the jump shot, I think the one thing that people overlook is that it's something he's really never had. And although, you know, it's four years later, having to add that kind of weapon into your, your skill set at the highest level of competition isn't something that exactly happens overnight. Now, so when I say to you, but Kevin, you say it doesn't happen overnight, but Ben Simmons has been in the league for a few years. How much longer do we have to wait for him to show us what we expected from him when he was number one overall pick? I mean, look at a guy like Giannis Antetokounmpo. Takumbo, that's someone that's, you know, almost parallel with Ben that people like to compare Ben to. And it took him, you know, five, six, seven years before he really made that big step and added that skill to, you know, his offensive tool belt. So although there is that major point of it's been four years, it's come along very slowly. But I mean, hey, baby steps are still moving forward. So I think it's something that will come. It's just it's, it's going to take time. It's just, it's, I know it's hard for a lot of people to hear that because there, there's just a lack of patience at this point. You know, it's the idea that the Eagles frustrated everybody. The Sixers have been underwhelming at times. They've been disappointing. And people want to see more from Ben. They feel like that Embiid has stepped up. You mentioned Tobias Harris. He's finally, you know, kind of had a little breakout now that Doc Rivers is his coach again. It just feels like you want to see that from Ben too, and you're not getting that. So... You know, what, what do you say to the people out there who are just so frustrated with this situation with Ben Simmons? Because I know for me, I don't even know if he's a point guard. I'm not even fully sure that him being a point guard is the solution. I, I personally think 
that I want to see more Milton and Maxie with the ball in their hand and Ben Simmons playing off of them a little bit more. And I think that could open up Ben's game. But for whatever reason, they still put the ball in Ben Simmons. That's my frustration. But I know for a lot of fans out there, they're saying, Kevin, you're ridiculous. Ben needs to score. You need to get rid of him. The main thing I would say is that no matter what player it is in the league, they're going to have their weaknesses, and it's all about building around that. And for the first time in a while, the Sixers have done a very good job with that. Daryl Morey did a great job putting a supporting cast around him that is going to help mask that, you know, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say even it's an inability, a reluctance to shoot in Simmons and surrounding him guys like Curry, Harris, Milton, who can space the floor and, you know, allow him to play his game. Because although you can harp on the weaknesses, the goal should be to maximize the elite parts of his game, which is his ability to get to the rim, his ability to draw space, and, you know, create room for guys, for shooters. And now they have those shooters who can space the floor and allow him to elevate the parts of his game that are already at a top level. Kevin, what do you expect to see from this game tonight from the 76ers who have almost everyone back but Seth Curry going against a Heat team that they struggled with the other night? I would hope to see the dominant wins that we saw early on this season. You know, Even though they walked away with the win last night, there was no reason that that game should have went to overtime, let alone the Sixers had to claw back in the end. Like you said, they're almost at full strength now. They had the advantage Tuesday night. I would like to see the Sixers get back on track and start to remind the league of the team they were prior to being hit with the you know strictness of the health and safety protocols. Your probable starters for tonight are Danny Green, Tobias Harris, Joel Embiid, Tyrese Maxey, and Ben Simmons. I'm telling you, Kevin, I like that lineup. I like that lineup a lot. <laughs> It's intriguing, but I mean, when Seth Curry's back, it's so hard to, you know, if you want to insert Maxi, who's the guy that goes to the bench? So I know a lot of people are clamoring for Danny Green to be that guy, but it's just Danny Green brings much more value as a starter than he does as a reserve. So although I could see Maxi being a starter for the Sixers in the future, I just don't know if it's this imminent future. He's Kevin McCormick. Make sure you follow him on Twitter at KevinMCC973 for all your Sixers coverage. He is at the center tonight, and of course, you can hear the Sixers versus Heat coming up next here on 97.3 ESPN at 7 o'clock. And as all guest Kevin appeared on the Boardwalk on the hotline. Check out all of his work over at 97.3 ESPN.com. Kevin, great stuff tonight. and Enjoy the game. Thanks, Josh. You take care. Of course, 97.3 ESPN.com and the 97.3 ESPN mobile app, the most comprehensive Sixers coverage on planet Earth from Kevin McCormick, Paul Hudrick, Jason Blevins. You can't beat the three-headed monster Sixers coverage that we have over on our website and on the 97.3 ESPN mobile app powered by First Bank of Sea Isle City. We'll get to your text coming up next, 609-403-0973. Sixers, Ben Simmons, James Harden, Eagles head coaching situation, plus my fan dual sportsbook pick for the night. We'll get to all that coming up next here on 97.3 ESPN FM, Josh Hennig, hanging out with you here on Game Night, leading you up to Sixers basketball. Now, more Game Night with Josh Hennig on 97.3 ESPN and the free mobile app. Josh Hennig here in the Matt Black Kia Studios on 97.3 ESPN. And, of course, Sixers basketball versus the Heat coming up at the top of the hour right here on 97.3 ESPN. We'll get to your text in just a moment at 609-403-0973. But first, I want to remind you about my friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. The football playoffs are my favorite time of year. And, you know, I can't wait to bet all the action this weekend on FanDuel Sportsbook. If you've never tried FanDuel before, the playoffs are a perfect time to give it a shot. Because right now, new users get an exclusive 25-1 to odds boost on any team to win this weekend. Whether you're going to want to jump in on the Bills and the Ravens, you want to jump in on the Bucks and the Saints, you want to jump in on the Packers and the Rams, you want to, you think the Chiefs are going to beat the Browns? That's right, twenty-five to one odds boost on any team to win this weekend for new users on FanDuel Sportsbook. All you got to do is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app and use my promo code Hennig, so they know that I sent you to get that exclusive. 25 to 1 odds boost with the promo code H E N N I G. I told you guys a couple weeks ago, use that 25 to 1 odds boost on Alabama. Alabama has gotten you some money in these college football playoffs. Well, I'm thinking the Chiefs, they're like Alabama. Same deal right now. 
25 to 1 odds boost, but you got to use promo code Hennig, H E N N I G, with FanDuel Sportsbook. Just download the app, sign up, new user, you get that odds boost. 25 to 1 on FanDuel Sportsbook. Must be 21 or to play and present in New Jersey or PA. New users only. Must wager on designated boost market deposit required. Max bonus $125. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 100-GAMBLER. I'll give you my FanDuel Sportsbook pick coming up in about eight minutes from now for tonight's Sixers game. Let's get your text board right now at 609-403-0973. Tito over in EHT says, Is Deuce Stanley a great fit for the Eagles? You know, Tito, it's interesting because I don't know if Deuce Stanley's a good or bad Bad fit. I do think that Deuce Stanley is a guy that has to be considered. Number one, he's lasted multiple coaching administrations. He was here with Andy Reid. He was here with Chip Kelly. He was here with Doug Peterson. I think that that sustainability, that ability to last, outlast other people, it's got to speak for something. I know a lot of players think very highly of him. I think if you hire Deuce, you have to, as I said earlier in the show, you have to be the kind of person who says, all right, if Deuce Stanley is going to be our head coach, then we need to make sure that he has strong offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators around him. So maybe that's a situation where you hire Deuce Stanley, but you call Matt LaFleur. I'm sorry, Mike LaFleur, the 49ers. Matt LaFleur is the Packers coach. His brother Mike is on the offensive coaching staff of the 49ers. And you say, Mike LaFleur, why don't you come and be our offensive coordinator? Or you call Graham Harrell, who's the OC over with USC and say, Graham Harrell, do you want to leave the college football ranks and be the primary play call with the Philadelphia Eagles? Because remember, they were going to talk to Graham Harrell last year, but because Doug Peterson would give it the play call and Graham Harrell said thanks, but no thanks. I think those are some guys that might strongly consider the job because Deuce Stanley is not going to be the primary play caller. He's going to be a CEO. He's going to be a, uh, an executive overseeing the football team. Kind of like what John Harbaugh does down in Baltimore. And then for defensive coordinator, you know, maybe you go to someone like Gerard Mayo and say, look, we interviewed you for the head coaching job. Would you like to be the DC here? Because you're not really the DC over with the Patriots. You're part of a, basically a triumvirate of multiple defensive co- coaches who are all under the guidance of Bill Belichick. You can blaze your own path here. You know, you can go to maybe some of the different guys around the league Maybe you go out and get a veteran guy. You know, maybe this is where you do call a guy like Wade Phillips, for example, and say, Wade, he's still interested in coaching. We got a young head coach. Why don't you come in and run the defense? What do you want to do with that? Can we have a conversation? Or do you call, you know, someone like Marvin Lewis and say, Marvin, I know you're not getting head coaching jobs, but I know you've been coaching in the NFL. You've coached in college. Would you be interested in being the head coach of the defense for the Eagles? I think that's where Deuce would be a great fit. It's only if you get the right kind of coordinators around him because I think Deuce can be the leader of men. He can be the guy who runs the football operation. He can be the guy who is the face of the franchise in terms of the coaching staff. But you got to have the right people around him because there's no way whether it's Deuce or any of these coaches can get hired and you not have a strong coaching staff around them. you got to make sure that whoever is the next Eagles head coach, you got to make sure the coaching staff is in better shape than it was with Doug Peterson. 609-403-0973 is the text board. 609-403-0973. Uh, Joey D. Inventor says, Josh, with all the uncertainty, especially with the Eagles coaching staff, is it safe to say it's an all-out rebuild for the Eagles? You know, Joey D, I don't think it's an all-out rebuild because you're get, if your offensive line is healthy next year, you got Lane Johnson, Brandon Brooks, if Jason Kelsey comes back, Isaac Sayamalu, and either Maialata or Dillard at left tackle, your offensive line is already going to be in a much better place than you were this year. Miles Sanders, let's say he plays at minimum 12 of 16 games and he plays the level we know he can play, and he gets more touches under the new head coach. He's arguably a top 10 back in the league in terms of production, is Miles Sanders. He was top 10 in the league in all-purpose yards his rookie year when he was getting all those touches. We know what he's capable of. 
We know that Greg Ward has shown himself to be a very good slot receiver. Whether it's Wentz, whether it's Hurts, he got touches, he got looks. Dallas Goddard is going to be a top 10 tight end in this league at worst, in my opinion. I think the guy has already shown you the ability to be a very effective weapon. So we know on the offensive side of the ball, you're not walking in with a bare bones of anything. And whoever the coach is, whether they want Wentz or whether it's Hurts, we're assuming the next guy coming in is going to want to develop Carson Wentz or Hurts to be better than they were this year. So at least on offense, I don't think it's a rebuild. I think it's a retool. It might be a remake. It might be a realignment. But I think it's a rebuild. And the same thing on defense. Brandon Graham, Fletcher Cox, Javon Hargrave, and if Malik Jackson is still here, you got some dudes on the defensive line along with Josh Sweat. Alex Singleton proved to you he is a starting NFL linebacker. Darius Slay, high-level cornerback. You just got to fix secondary. To me, I've been saying this for a couple weeks now, I draft Patrick Sertain. He just declared for the NFL draft. You get a guy who could be across from Darius Slay the first time you have two high-level starting cornerbacks in your secondary since it was Lido and Sheldon. Remember, it was, well, first it was actually Troy Vincent and Bobby Taylor. And then after them, it was Lido Shepard and Sheldon Brown. And then you had Asante Samuel come in there. But since those guys, you haven't really had a lockdown corner. You haven't really had guys who take over and shut down the secondary. And if you're going against the Giants and the Cowboys, and the Washington football team, year in, year out, in the NFC East, you got to make sure you have a defense that can slow those offenses down because you're not going to stop them all together. Washington showed you that they got a two-headed running back monster with Antonio Gibson and J.D. McKissick. Terry McLaurin is phenomenal. Logan Thomas has come out of nowhere. Go down to Dallas. Amari Cooper. Michael Gallup. you got C.D. Lamb. You got Ezekiel Elliott, who's going to stop those guys. Saquon Barkley up in New York. If Evan Ingram can ever get it right, he's dangerous. Sterling Shepard, he's dangerous. Darius Slayton, he is a monster deep threat. You got to have a defense to keep up with those teams. You can't just outscore everybody. So to me, I say you can retool the defense. You can recalibrate the offense. I don't think it's an all-out rebuild. I think that we've seen numerous teams go from worst to first in the NFL. It happens almost every single year. Look at the Browns. The Browns are in the second round of the playoffs. They haven't been in the playoffs in, what was it, 18 years? They didn't win a playoff game since 1994. Bill Belichick was on that staff. You know who was on that that staff with Bill Belichick? Jim Schwartz. He was a coaching intern in Cleveland back then. That's how long ago it was. So, If the Browns can do it, why can't the Eagles? That's what I say, Joey D. If the Browns can do it, why can't the Eagles? Stefanski has shown you that you can get a viable coach in there and take a quarterback who was questioned, considered broken, people didn't know he could be any good, and you can win a playoff game with him and get to the second round. I think it's a huge deal. I think it's something that gets overlooked at times. And I think whether it's Deuce Staley, I think whether it's I don't know, Robert Salah, whether it's Joe Brady, whoever the coach is in here, I think that coach can get this team over the edge. But you've got to make sure, like I said earlier, you've got to get the right coaches. Because it doesn't matter if it's Staley, Salah, Brady, Kafka, Moore, Todd Bowles. It doesn't matter who it is. You got to make sure that you don't run into the same problems you ran into with Doug Peterson, where there are questions about the coaching staff. There are questions about the coach coaching the coaching staff. You can't have that. You got to make sure everything is calibrated this time because if the Eagles want to be mentioned in the same conversation as the Steelers and the Ravens and these the, the Seahawks, the Patriots, if you want to be a team that's parentally in that conversation, you got to have stability at the coaching position. And right now, you're going to have your third head coach since 2013. That is not 
a sign of stability at all. 609-403-0973 is the text board. Josh Hennick here on Game Night on 97.3 ESPN, of course, being brought to you by my friends over at weightliftinghq.com. Use the code RADIO10 to check out for 10% off your entire order for benches, squat racks, kettlebells, dumbbells, cardio and fitness machines, resistance bands, and more. Whatever you need, they have it over there at weightliftinghq.com. And also my friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Use the code Hennig at sign up. 25 to 1 odds on any playoff team this weekend. My FanDuel Sportsbook bets for you this evening with the Sixers game coming up here on 97.3 ESPN. I am taking the Sixers. The line's actually been bet down last time I saw the 9, but I took it at 10.5. I didn't care. I think with the Sixers having all these guys come back, you get 10.5. You're going to do a same game parlay, which is exclusive to the FanDuel Sportsbook app. Ben Simmons over 7.5 assists. Duncan Robinson over 16.5 points. Combined with the Sixers spread, it's a nice little same game parlay. About plus 295 on that same game parlay on FanDuel Sportsbook. Don't miss out. Jump on there now. Use the code Hennig when you sign up for that 25 to 1 odds boost. I am Josh Hennig. You can follow me on Twitter at Josh Hennig on Twitter. H E N N I G. I'll be back tomorrow night for Game Night here on 97.3 ESPN for a Football Friday. Have a great night.